I want to start off uh, today with a story um, of a guy named Jesse, and I don't believe that that's his name. Um, I, th- I believe his name was changed for uh, confidentiality, but we're going to call him Jesse today. And um, But he hadn't um, experienced a full night's sleep. It had been over a year. Um, he had all of a sudden had this case of insomnia. And, um, you know, he, he walked into this guy's office and it was very evident he hadn't slept. His, his eyes were very dark with bags, probably darker than you've ever seen in someone else's eyes. And he was just 20 years old. Now, Jesse had um, been a, a straight-A student throughout school, a star athlete. He received um, a full-ride scholarship to play um, sports out of college. But he had recently lost his scholarship due to his um, inability to sleep. And um, it was affecting, you know, his grades. It was affecting his ability to, to play in the sports. And he had been searching for help everywhere. His parents had taken him to all these different therapists, to all these different science studies, trying to figure out why he couldn't sleep. And... Um, up until he was his 19th birthday, he was fine. He slept totally fine every day, but on his, the night after his 19th birthday, it says that he woke up at 3.30 a.m. just shivering like he was freezing to death. And um, the, the temp in the house hadn't changed. You know, he was sleeping in all his regular um, clothes and bed that he had always slept in. Three hours later that night, he had he'd gathered more blankets, put them on top of him, and he still couldn't fall asleep. He had this fear all of a sudden that if he fell asleep, he would never wake up. And that fear had been keeping him from sleeping every time he would start to doze off and then he'd wake up in a panic of like, if I sleep, I won't wake up. Now we're in our series, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And we're looking at how Jesus has called us to to a life of fullness, a a life of abundancy and and rich and satisfying life. That's his purpose that he came to give us that kind of life. But we're going to talk in this series about how we're missing the fullness of life because we haven't let God work through the fullness of us. Uh, We've only given him our spirituality. We've only given him some of our actions and little bits and pieces, but we haven't allowed him to come and work through every being that is inside of us. And today we're talking about how Jesus wants to come and he wants to break the power of our past to be able to take us to the future things he's called us to. Now, Jesse, in a therapy session with a a man named Mark Wolin, who is the director of the Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco. Mark is also the world leader in the field of inherited family trauma. He's also author of a book, It Didn't Start With You. Um, I would highly encourage everybody to read that book, um, at least listen to the audio book and work through the things that they have in there. It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin. Um, The subtitle is How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. Right Through the session, Jesse learned that his insomnia, these feelings of freezing and the fear of death, was actually family trauma lived out in him. Jesse had an uncle named Colin he had never heard about before who had froze to death at the age of 19 in a blizzard in Canada. Jesse was unconsciously reliving aspects of his uncle's death that he had never heard about before in his life. Once the connection and the understanding had been made and walking through um, a few different exercises of of passing those feelings back to his uncle who had already passed, saying, you know, I don't don't need this in my life, you know, um, I need to pass that back to you. I believe that you would want me to live a full life. Jesse was able to sleep again after just a few days, really. Now, how many of you guys find that story a little bit hard to believe? No? Just, just a few people here. Because I read, I read that and I was like, yeah, I don't know <laughs> about that. But what's coming, it's kind of crazy, is that scientists are finding that we pass on trauma, not just through our words and our actions, but in our actual DNA. Right? They, they literally have found the parts of our DNA that, that gets passed on from generation to generation of trauma that's been lived through our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents. Um, Right, I could spend a lot of time going into all the scientific research because I enjoy those things. Um, but if you want to know more, again, it didn't start with you. The book by Mark Wolin um, would be a great place to start. And uh, I think it would actually be a really cool small group if somebody would be interested in leading that. Um, and by cool, I meant like kind of deep and sad, but healing and, and great on the other side of it as well. Um, but what I find even more amazing than all of the science that they are coming to find is that the Bible told us this information thousands of years ago. In Exodus 34, 7, God is speaking. It's in the middle of actually the Ten Commandments. And he says, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children 
and their grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. Now, it does seem a little bit harsh, but I believe that God was just laying out a truth of how we were created, that the consequences of our mistakes, purposeful or accidental, get laid upon, as it says, or passed on to the third and fourth generation. What's crazy is science is confirming that past the fourth generation, if those things haven't been an issue, they don't get passed on. But this was for primitive survival needs, right? It's not like God's like, I want them to be punished. I want them to to feel it from generation to generation. But this was the thing that was needed for survival, right? A, A lion mauled your sister. So your DNA puts, be afraid of lions into it. So that when your children are born, they have a natural fear of lions so that they do not get eaten by lions, right? Does that make sense? Right? And so it, it was imprinted on us um, so that, you know, your children don't turn into Simba snacks. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty good, I thought. Okay. Um, but for most of us now, you know, it's, it's mostly unnecessary. We have lots of other ways to learn about fear. And we just get inherited trauma. Isn't that great? Um, you guys are way too excited about inherited trauma. But we're going to talk today about how we don't have to live with those. Right, that just because they're written into our DNA doesn't mean that we have no ability to do anything with them. But even more so, through the power of Christ, we get to break free from those things. But only if we address them and work through them. Peter Scazzaro, the author of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says, One of the greatest tragedies in the church is the large numbers of people crippled by their past. Unaware that their past impacts their present, they bury or minimize their family history that lives inside them and settle for a constricted Christian life in which they are stuck spiritually and emotionally. Now, there are numerous external forces that impact us, um, all sorts of things that we go through in life, but the family in which we grew up is the primary one, except in very rare cases, the most powerful system that shapes and influences who you are is the family that you grew up in. And that even starts with whether or not you had a family to grow up in or not, and whether that family was whole, or the, how, things, how they interacted. All of that is learned things that we live through in life, and we'll get into that later. But Peter Scazzaro first, uh, he refers to this process of working through our past and breaking that power as going backwards to be able to move forwards. We talked last week about... Um, about loss and grief and how we really don't take time for it because we want our lives moving up and to the right, you know? I guess that for you guys, it's over here. Um, but uh, thank you. Um, but we, we just want to move our life on a, a, a smooth trajectory. Um, Zach even mentioned that today in um, our team rally that, man, it, like, it was, we want life to always be moving forward, but In reality, if we're always trying to move forward, we're ignoring a lot of things that God wants to use to shape us to be able to go forward to where he has for us. And so we need to often go backwards to be able to move forwards. Now, the first part of the the framework that, um, that we need to have is that we need to acknowledge how the blessings and the sins of our family, going back three or four generations, profoundly impacts who you are today. Now, I believe most of us are are slightly aware, at least, of how our childhood um, and and how we were parented affects how we live today, right? I mean, that's kind of the the running joke of therapy is that, like, well, tell me about your childhood. You know, tell me, because that we, we have an understanding that that has affected who we are today. But have you ever considered that you may be dealing with trauma or generational patterns that go back to the 1800s? Right? That, that changes a lot of things when you think of generations of your family and things that they have gone through that impact who you are today. Right? I have enough trauma just for the 35 years I've been alive. Um, right? Like surviving Y2K, 9-11, going through the, the wild west of the internet and the development of social media, and then COVID. You know, not even just like, I mean, alone being alive in the 90s. There's a lot of things. But, man all the way back to the 1800s, affects who I am today. Science has found that people who had relatives that were involved in the Holocaust are 30% more likely to struggle with PTSD symptoms, even if they've had nothing directly traumatic happen in their lives. If your family immigrated or was forced out of a country or their land in those three to four generations, you're carrying carrying around some amount of trauma that is affecting you today because of the things they went through. 
Right? I belong to the, the Caddo Nation tribe of indigenous people in America. And uh, in 1859, my ancestors, after years of killings, betrayal, and theft by the government, were moved from our homeland of East Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, to a really small parcel of land in Oklahoma. And I, I've never really thought about how that affected my life today. Like, I've, I've known about it. I've felt for my previous generations and family, but I've never realized that maybe what they've gone to affected me today. And I look, you know, as I'm studying through this and, and working on a message to bring to you, I'm very much still working through these things myself. And um, I, I look back at um, some of the most traumatic moments of my life, and I... Uh, we got moved in sixth grade. My family moved like two hours away from the, the home that I grew up in. And um, that was a really traumatic event of my life. And I thought for that time that like, that was just because I was a kid and moving. But I feel like there's a good chance that I've been carrying trauma that was already in my DNA that was just multiplied by the experience that I went through. Um, you know, did you know that Native American youth on reservations have a, the highest suicide rate in the Western Hemisphere? Um, sometimes it's close to 10 to 19 times higher than the rest of American youth. Many reservations consider a week without a suicide a blessing. Um, and what, what they're finding when they go in and, and working with these youth is that they are wearing and carrying the weight of all the generations that before them and living it out in their very lives. Now, it's not just these large traumatic events that, that have been found, passed on through DNA, but just similar trends from generation to generation. Things like suicide or alcoholism, addiction, depression, unstable marriages, unwed pregnancies passed down from generation to generation, the mistrust of authority or unresolved conflict gets passed down. They literally found people that, that are getting involved in things that, that is totally against their character because of a grandfather or a great uncle that, uh, you know, had something happen to them and they are like living out revenge without even knowing that they were related. Now, this stuff happened in the Bible as well. Um, we look at three generations in the Old Testament um, and see it very alive and well there. When we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac's son, Jacob, there was a pattern of lying between those generations. Abraham lied about um, his, his wife, Sarah. Isaac and Rebekah's marriage was characterized by lies. Jacob lied to basically everyone. Um, Jacob's name means deceiver. Um, ten of Jacob's children lied about what happened to Joseph. There was favoritism by a parent. Abraham favored um, Ishmael. Isaac favored Esau. Jacob favored Joseph. And then after Joseph was gone, he favored Benjamin. In each family, brothers were separated. They were cut off from each other. Isaac and Ishmael were separated. Jacob fled from his brother Esau. Joseph was separated from the rest of his family. There was marriage struggles. Abraham had a child out of wedlock with Sarah's servant. Isaac had a weird relationship struggles between the two sisters he married. Jacob had two wives and two concubines and led to many different kids from many wives. And there was a whole bunch of issues there as well. Now, there are other examples in the Bible. This isn't just one case. Like David, that we talk about the man after God's own heart, his sons and grandchildren suffered because of his sin with Bathsheba. It was passed down that it would mess up his family from generations. God allowed these stories to be recorded in the Bible to teach us and that we need to look inside our past to see what patterns or trauma we may need to work through. Peter Scazzaro says it this way, we may have Jesus in our heart, but we have grandpa in our bones. Friend, that's a good one. I remember that, okay? Uh, man, I, I'm gonna, in just a moment, I'm gonna list just a whole bunch of really short sentences. And if you find yourself saying any of these things regularly in your life, when you encounter hardship or when things maybe aren't going your way or you run into things, there's probably past trauma that you need to work through. If, if there's a constant thing that rings in your head that says, I'll be left behind or I'll be abandoned or I'll be rejected or I'll be alone or I'll have nobody, I'll be helpless or I'll lose control. Maybe things like I don't matter or they don't want me or I'm not enough. Maybe even the opposite of I'm too much so they'll leave me, they'll hurt me, they'll betray me or I'll be annihilated, I'll be destroyed. I won't exist. Maybe it's just it's hopeless or I'll lose everything. Right? I'll fall apart, I'll go crazy, I'll lose my family, I'll do something horrible. They will humiliate me, they will lock me up. I'll be hated, I'll kill myself, for it will never end. If any of those ring true to something that, that, that goes on in your head, and maybe you're like, I'm not sure if that's something that comes up to me, I would even talk to your spouse or somebody who's really close and say, what's something that I say often, right, that when I'm going through hardship, what's this 
this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy in a negative way that I keep saying over myself. Now, in general, as I talked about being your family, being that first source of everything for you in life, they actually say that the way a baby feels about their mother is an addiction. Like it's the same drugs that are being released in their brain as somebody who's addicted to something is the relationship a child needs to have with their mother. So when there's separation, they literally go through the same withdrawal effects that someone who has been addicted and getting completely cut off from what they want in life. And so like as a baby who can't even express it or understand it, that kind of traumatic things already started in their life from a disconnection from their mother. Right? So if today you don't or you didn't have a healthy relationship with your parents, and maybe you still have negative feelings towards them, it's literally proven that your quality of life will be lower because of that trauma that's been passed down in those moments that you have not worked through and reconciled in your life. Mark Wolin, um, the author of It Didn't Start With You, lists 21 invisible dynamics of our past that can affect our future relationships if they're not addressed. Right? And I'm pretty sure when I get to the end of these 21s that none of us can say that these things have never happened in our family at some point. Right? Maybe you had a difficult relationship with your mother. Maybe you reject, blame, or you judge one of your parents. Maybe you merged with the feelings of a parent. Like you had a mom who was always blaming the dad, and so you blame him as well because you feel how your mom felt. Maybe you experience an interruption in the early bond with your mother, whether it's purposeful or accidental. Even if, you know, your child had to spend time in an incubator or something um, that separated you from your mom, literally caused a disconnection that could be affecting your life today. Maybe you had to take care of your parents' feelings, or your parents were unhappy together, or your parents didn't stay together. Right? Maybe your parent or grandparent abandoned a former partner. Um, maybe the, the, your mother's love of her life broke her heart, or your father, vice versa. Right? Maybe your parent or grandparent remained alone after a divorce or a death. Maybe your parent or grandparent suffered through their mar marriage. Maybe your parent was disrespected by the other parents, or maybe you had a parent that died young. Maybe one of your parents mistreated the other, or maybe you alone had hurt a former partner. You, maybe you've had too many partners in the life. Maybe you had an abortion or you gave a child up for adoption. Maybe you were your mother's confidant or your father's favorite. Or even if someone in your family chose to not get married, it could affect how you are living out your life today. Now, I think it's pretty impossible, like I said, for none of those things to have happened somewhere in the history of your family going back three or four generations. And so that's where we really begin. Right, the experts recommend that you genogram your family, identifying how it has shaped you. So basically, you, you draw out a family tree going back three or four generations. Um, you don't need to include your cousins, but you should include your, your parents and grandparents, great-grandparents, and their siblings. Um, and then you work on filling in all the gaps and, and what, what did their life look like? Um, what, what happened in their lives? Who got married? Who didn't get married? Who had divorces or accidental deaths or died young or anything traumatic? And you just work through it all and you make a list kind of next to each person and, and seeing what's going on. You ask questions like, how are the relationships with each other? Right? And you may really need to involve some other people in your family to be able to figure these things out. Uh, did anything largely traumatic happen? Was there family abuse, unexpected deaths, tragic events? Did people serve in wars? Were they a part of the, the Holocaust or other genocides? Were there family scandals or family secrets that nobody has talked about before? Right? I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm working through this in my life right now, and I've only been able to kind of do one part of my family, um, and I, I need to start working through all the other ones. But I can see even, like I mentioned before, with just... Um, the, the one part of my Native American family, like how maybe some of those stuff are affecting um, my life today. And um, man, once you get it as finished as you can, you look at it and you go, are there patterns or there, there are trauma? Is there things that, that maybe are resonating with me? Right? Is there any message or an unfinished work that could be written into your DNA that you need to start resolving that maybe isn't even yours to resolve? Right, this is, takes us to step two, which is identifying those patterns or trauma. Uh, Mark Wolin calls this finding your core sentence, right? Those, those brief phrases that we mentioned earlier that, um, you know, that you're always saying about how life treats you or the things that happen to you. And it's probably, like I said, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, 
Mark offers that sometimes you have to start with what's the worst thing that could happen to someone? Right? Because as much as you think in your head that what you believe is the worst thing that could happen to someone is the same for everybody else, we all have a different fear that is motivating us. And so all of our answers will be different there and it would line up to possibly with things that you need to work through. Um, you know, and so I, literally Victoria and I were just talking through these things and, um, you know, I'm trying to find what mine is. And I, I feel like my core sentence is something along the lines of I'm the reason bad things happen to other people. The people that I love or people that I love are better off without me. And I'm still trying to get to why that's the core and what's that is. Because when I think about what's the worst thing that could happen to someone it would be that they would die and nobody would notice or that nothing would change if they left. Right. So then we move on to step three. Right. And those seem kind of like hard stuff, right? But they're actually a little bit easy um, compared to step three. And step three is to do the hard work of discipleship. Jesus did not sugarcoat the cost of discipleship, right? In Luke 9, 23 through 25, Jesus says, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? Right? To me, this verse has a whole different meaning when you start to consider it in the context of giving up your family history, of giving up the things of your culture um, that don't reflect Jesus. Right? That, that what he's asking is you to give up your own way, to sacrifice it on the cross that Jesus died on daily for you, to remember that your old life is dead and that you'd pick up your new life and follow Jesus into what he has for you. But none of those things are just easy. Right? It's not easy to just give up our old ways and to, to work through those things. Um, there's another time that Jesus talks about how if you really love me, like, then, then you must hate your father or your mother. And I believe what he was getting at is these things, that we learn so much from our family growing up, whoever raised us, those type of things that when we choose to follow the culture and the things that we learned that are against what Jesus has been teaching, we're choosing to love our family more than we love Jesus and what he has for us. And so we have to give that up to be able to be followers of Jesus. Um, right, the leading experts literally are saying that many of our life's struggles are rooted not just in our own past, but our family's past. A lot of depression, anxiety, pain, the phobias we have, our obsessive thoughts, all of those are rooted in our family history. And if you want to be free from it, you have to do the work. Right? I believe Jesus has already called you free. I believe that when you've accepted him into your life, that, that he has broken the chains. But we don't live free. All right, so once you have your core sentence, right, the pattern that's sticking out to you, you need to do the work of getting through it. Right? First off, if you don't have healthy relationships with your parents, start there if they're still living. Maybe you need to examine how the trauma of their past led them to be the parent that they were to you. Right? And it's not easy, right? My, my grandpa was an abusive alcoholic father to my dad. Um, they were, they were, my dad's like childhood was just full of trauma every day. And, um, you know, growing up, I was like, my dad is not a good dad. Right? And um, now that I'm older and able to look at the childhood he had and the example of a father that was placed in front of him, now I can look at my dad and say, wow, he's a great father for overcoming the things that he's overcome and parenting me the way that he did, though he made mistakes, and where he came from and the father that he became to me was a good dad. All right? And my dad and I have had lots of, of talks about this. But I also think that because my dad feared his dad, right, that it was written in my DNA to, to have issues with my dad. Right? And I have to work through that and had to, to heal from that. And um, I was really even talking to my sisters about that a little bit as well. But when you go to heal things with your parents, you can't expect your parents to change. Right? That's not the goal. I mean, that would be great, right, that they would change, but we cannot change other people. Um, it's not in our power, but what we do have power to do is change ourselves. So when we go to try and heal things with our parents, we go expecting us to change, not them to change, right? For us to grow and become better and more free, right? You need to go to them and express openly your feelings. You need to get it out. You, your desire to mend things, that you want things to be better, 
you're probably gonna have to work through forgiveness. And to be honest, it will probably take professional help um, because that's not easy to do. Some of you are just smiling and laughing like, ah, that sounds like the most impossible task you've ever said, Andrew. And, uh, you know, that's why I said Jesus will help you because I can't do the impossible for you, but Jesus can. Thank you for the one clap. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, but, man, some of you don't know who your parents are. Some of you, your parents may not be living and you're still holding on to those traumas and that's normal. Like nobody in here is saying that that's out of the norm. But you still need to go and free yourself from that. Right? Um, studies have shown it that when you picture them in your head, even if you don't even know what they look like, picture what you would assume your parents would look like and, and then begin to talk to them and have these same types of conversations with them, that when we imagine something, when we put the picture of who they are in our minds, that our brains don't know the difference between it being real or being in our head. And so then when we work through it, even with the, the imaginary pictures, maybe you will never be able to work through things even if your parent's still living because of um, how they are acting or how they feel. Right, you can still picture them, and your brain still makes the right connections to be able to work through those things. Um, you know, you can uh, say sentences to parents that maybe you never met and say, if it was easier for you to leave or give me away because of your past, I understand. You can say, I'll stop blaming you because that's only holding us both hostage. You can say, thank you for the gift of life. I promise not to squander it because I believe you would want me to live a better life. And these may be things you need to say often, right? When your core sentence comes up, you're going to have to work through it. Maybe you find that you're, you know, you look at your genogram and see that you're living out the, the trauma of somebody who had passed away or something that happened to somebody else in your history that, that is already gone or you don't have any connection with. In the same way, you can picture them and, and release the feelings back to them, right? You wouldn't want me to live what the trauma you lived through, so... Let me live the life that, I, that God's calling me to. And we have to speak those things because that's what makes the correlation in our brain when we literally speak it out. Um, and so I, I encourage you to work through those things. But also we have to do the hard work of changing things in our life. Right? You may be set free. Like I said, you know, often we live like the Israelites. They, were, they got freed from Egypt, you know, the, the Moses and, the, and Pharaoh and all the plagues and let my people go type of thing. Um, and they went free out into the desert. But all of them, they just complained, right? Man, it was so nice in Egypt, right? We had food. I know we had to work and our backs were beaten and it was long hours and really impossible living situations. But I don't know what to do with my freedom, and so I just keep going back to that. I just keep desiring what it was before because we, we desire what's known versus the unknown. But let me tell you, freedom unknown is way better. And part of the problem is we don't have new commandments. So we just keep going back to the old way. Because remember when the Israelites lived in freedom in the middle of this verse where we're talking about things that affect us to the third and fourth generation was God giving them new commands of how to live in their freedom. Right, rewriting things for them. And so a lot of us live with unbiblical commandments that we learn from our families that's keeping us held in our past and we need to rewrite new commandments, the ones that Jesus has asked us to do, um, like loving ourselves or loving, our, loving God, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves and working through those things. Um, but most of us live in these unbiblical commandments that rule our lives that we learn from family and culture. Um, I want to give 10 unbiblical commandments, um, because I feel like that's a good number of commandments, um, right? But, but one of the, I'm really going to give 10 examples of the things that, that we hold unbiblical underneath them. And the first one is money, right? We learn about money from our family, um, however we grew up with it. And, and we don't always do the exact same thing. You could go, well, I'm not doing what my parents did with money, but you may be, you know, overcompensating the other direction because you don't want to be like them or vice versa. It's affecting things in our lives. And so maybe these are some of your thoughts about money that's not biblical, um, that money is the best source of security, that the more money you have, the more important you are. Or I need to make lots of money so that I can prove that I've made it in life. Right. Second thing we learn from our family is how to handle conflict. Right? We learn that from watching our parents and how they interact. Um, so if these are some of your thoughts of conflict, then you probably don't have a biblical view of it. And that's like avoid conflict at all costs. Right? 
just do whatever you need to do so people won't be mad at you, right? Or maybe you learned that fighting with dirty tactics is okay, right? The third thing we learn about from our parents is sex, right? Did you get the birds and bees talk from your parents or not, right? We, we, we often walk through life carrying those things, like sex is not to be spoken about openly, right? Or that men can be promiscuous, but women have to stay modest, right? Or maybe even just that sex is dirty, right? It's just wrong. Um, the fourth thing that we learn from our families is about grief and loss. We talked about this last week, right? We, maybe you walk around with the idea that sadness is a sign of weakness, right? Or maybe you carry that you're not allowed to be depressed, or maybe it's just you have to get over your losses and move on with life as fast as possible. Right? My dad would always say, just walk it off, whatever it was. I just had to walk it off. And so I think that's why I hike a lot. I don't know. <laughs> just trying to walk everything off. <laughs> um, the fifth thing we learned from our families is anger and how to handle it. Right? Maybe some of you think anger, anger is just dangerous and bad. So you just hide it and you just shove it down. Um, Right? Or maybe you learn that exploding in anger is okay if you're making a point. Or maybe you learn that sarcasm and passive aggression is an acceptable way to release anger. Right? We also learn about family from our family. That makes sense, right? Uh, some of you live with the lie that you owe your parents for all they've done for you. Some of you live with the lie that you don't speak of family's dirty laundry in public. So just keep all the secrets. Right? Some of you live that duty to family and culture comes before everything else. The seventh thing we learn is about relationships, right? We see how our parents' relationship worked, how the relationship with us, their friendships, right? And so some of us walk around believing that we're not supposed to trust people because they will hurt us, right? You just learn in general, don't let anyone ever hurt you. So you just always have walls up, right? You don't, you don't ever go through life with the ability to let anybody in. And when they do come in, then you just shove them back out and build a new wall because you don't let people in to hurt you, right? And that leads to don't show vulnerability, right? Never let people inside because then they'll just have stuff to hurt you. Eighth thing is our attitude, attitudes towards other cultures, right? Only be close to people like you is something that we learn. Sometimes it's just do not marry a person of a different race. The ninth thing we learn from our families is what is success, right? We learn that by what impresses our parents or what disappoints them, right? Is success getting into the best schools? Is success making lots of money? Is success getting married and having children, right? Is any of those things fully defined by the Bible for you? And the 10th thing we let our families you know, make these unbiblical commandments for us is our feelings and our emotions. We've been talking a lot about that. Um, but maybe you carry around still to this day and you, you almost, you hear my messages, you see the, the truth that's spoken um, from the scriptures that we share, but you still believe that you're not allowed to have certain feelings, right? Or you still feel that your feelings are not important. Or you still believe that reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay, Right? And these are all real things that, you know, other people deal with. None of you guys obviously deal with any of these things. I don't deal with them, you know, um, right? Yeah, <laughs> these are real things that, that are taught in our homes that we don't know, right? We, we learned them as kids before we had the ability to really process and think on our own, before our brains were even forming the ability to make judgments on our own. And so then we just have them learned deep inside of us. But these are these things that we don't let Jesus come in and transform for us, right? And then when we see it in the Bible, we start to discount the Bible as true because it goes against what I've learned from my parents, my family, the people who raised me. But Jesus wants to come in and change you, but that takes work, Man, make no mistake that the hard work of discipleship is necessary in order to let go of the unbiblical ways of living, right? It requires surrendering to the slow journey of being formed in new ways by Jesus, right? Man, it'd be great if it's just like, God, just, just like take it out, put the new stuff in, let me live today differently. Um, and uh, he kind of does, but not fully because we just keep going back to it, right? Like I said, he's already freed you if you believe in him. You already have the ability to walk away from it all and to, to accept the new commandments and live in them. We just have to do the work of choosing to do so. Right? And lastly, we need to get a great future out of our past. Did you know that one-fourth of the book of Genesis is about Joseph? Right? And it was about Joseph growing up into an emotionally and spiritually mature adult. 
who lived out his unique calling in God. As with many and most families, Joseph's family was characterized by a lot of brokenness. Just the same as we talked about, he was uh, the, the fourth generation there that we explained from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. Right? In Genesis 37, Joseph comes onto the scene. He's around 17 years old. He's the 11th of 12 sons, not including the sisters that, that he had, um, but he was the favorite of his father. He made him the Technicolor dream coat. Um, I think that's biblical. Uh, no, but he did make him a coat of many colors, right? They were in this complex, blended family. He had one, one dad. He had a mom, but there was other moms, three other moms that still lived in where part there, you know, his dad had two wives and two concubines, which is basically a mistress. There were people that, that were allowed to be a part of the family. They, they had even a lower um, authority level than the wives and lower than the husband. Um, but they were a part of the family and all their children were included. Now, Joseph, at 17 years old, we find him to be very immature, we find him arrogant, um, unaware of him talking about the visions that God had given him and how they were affecting his family, right? It made it so much worse that his brothers, older brothers, obviously, planned to kill him. Um, they were like, man, this Joseph is annoying. And uh, any of you guys plan to kill your siblings? All right. Okay. I know you're all laughing because you thought about it at one point in your childhood. You know, maybe not killing them, but like, we could probably get him lost in this grocery store, and maybe my parents won't remember. Uh, but, right, so they plan to just kill him. So they're, they're like, let's head out to the farm. They've been thinking about it. They're, they're out there, and actually Joseph is coming out to check on them and see how they're doing. And they see him from a distance, and they're like, it's our chance. We're going to kill Joseph here. We'll take back his coat all torn up. We'll put some of his blood on it, and we'll be like, we found just this coat, and he was killed by wild animals or something. We don't know what happened to him. And, um, right, and so... That was their plan, but literally they, they threw him in a pit um, because nobody could, like, bring themselves to actually kill him, right? And uh, they're like, we'll just leave him in a pit, and uh, he'll, you know, let nature do its course. And, um, but then some slave traders came by, and they're like, you know what's even better? If we make money off of him. Um, anyone would think about selling their siblings? Yeah? Okay, see? You guys are not that different. I know you're judging Joseph's brothers right now, but, but we've been there. Okay, so... They, they see the slave traders come by and they're like, let's make some money off this deal. And they sell him into slavery. They still tear up his coat. They kill a goat. They put the blood on it, take it back to his dad and say, all we found was Joseph's coat. He's been killed by wild animals or something. We don't know what happened. And, you know, it adds to the lying and the secrets that was already the generational patterns of their family. But now think of Joseph, right? He's, he's in this caravan now, probably chained up. Um, and in that moment, he's lost all of his family. He's lost any, any ability to direct his future. His culture is being taken from him because he's headed off into some other country where they do everything different, right? He probably even lost his favorite foods because no one makes foods like his mom does, right? You know, all those things are just gone and um, his freedom, his hopes, his language, he's no longer probably going to speak because he's hardly going to run into anybody who spoke what he spoke. And then he's sold in as a slave into the home of Potiphar, right? And then he gets accused of, uh, of rape, falsely accused of rape, and he's sent to prison, right? And then a door opened for the possibility of getting out of prison, but then he was forgot about. They think that he was in prison for somewhere between like 10 to 13 years for something he didn't do, right? And it's not, we were just, I was having a conversation with some people earlier about prison today being, you know, it's maybe kind of like a vacation if you're a parent. Uh, you know, you don't have to deal with your kids. You get food every day, a bed, you know. Um, you're like, well, oh, maybe. But that was not prison back then, okay? It was uh, dirty as a dungeon. It was often in, like, the, the sewer system type of thing where everything flowed down to just because it tended to be underground. and um, Right? So from age 17 to roughly 30, we would look at Joseph's life as a tragedy. Right? If anyone had permission in Scripture to be filled with bitterness, to have rage, to be upset about all the things that had happened to him that was undeserved, it was Joseph. But yet, when we read through the story, we find Joseph as a man who is a faithful seeker and lover of God. That even in those horrific events that happened outside of his control, he stayed faithful and he rose above through the pain. Right? And the credible thing happened, right? Basically overnight, because of him being able to interpret a dream, Joseph went from being a prisoner 
to second in command of all G- Egypt in basically the known world. Egypt was the powerhouse of, of the world at the time, and he was now second in control. And when his family showed up, he, when given a chance to do anything to them, he repays them in grace. Right? Joseph went back to go forward. And so what lessons can we learn from Joseph? So I have four quick things. Um, The first thing is Joseph had a profound sense of the bigness of God. Right? In Genesis 45, 8, when his family was um, concerned about Joseph, his, okay, so, you know, his brothers show up and his, they bring his dad and everybody's there and and he ends up bringing them all into a safe place to live because there's a famine going on. And, um, his dad passed away. And his brothers thought, the dad's the only reason Joseph's being nice. So as soon as our dad's gone, he's going to kill us. Like, he just brought us close. Keep your enemies closer than your friends, that type of thing. And so they're all concerned, and Joseph catches wind that they're concerned. And Joseph's response was, it was God who sent me here, not you. Right? When we remember, like we talked about last week, that God's ways are bigger and better than ours. It helps us stay focused and that, that he will use our past to put us in a place that he needs us in in the future, right? Joseph kept those visions in mind, the call of God, and allowed him to keep moving forward, right? You'll know that you're healed when you can look at the traumatic events of your past and say it was God who sent me there and not be angry at God for that, not be angry at the people to understand that God needed, allowed that to happen so that you could be the person he needs you to be in the, in the place you are in life now. All right, there's three things in this that I always take comfort in in God's bigness. Is first off that I'm not powerful enough to mess up God's plans. Right? And, and sometimes that leaves us from moving forward or working through things because we go, oh, what if I mess it up? Right? Now, as long as I'm trying to please God and making the, the best of my ability there, I can't mess up God's plans. Even in my mistakes and things, I can't mess up God's plans. Secondly, it's whatever God has called me to, he already factored in my mistakes and my weaknesses. Right, there's, a, there's a meme that's going around that instead of weaknesses, it says he factored in my stupidity. Um, it's maybe something you need to consider. But uh, no, just kidding. But whatever God has planned for you for your life, he already knows about your weaknesses. He already knows about the mistakes that you've done and that you will make, and he's still calling you to those things. And the third thing that I always take comfort in is 2 Peter 1, three tells me that he has given me everything I need for the life that he has called me to. And so I already have it. It's already there for me. And he's not asking me to do anything that he doesn't believe that I can do, that he hasn't factored in my mistakes, that he he knows I can't mess it up. And he's given me everything I need to live it. Right? And some of those things are the traumas of my past. Secondly, Joseph admitted honestly the sadness and the losses of his family. Right? Throughout the time you, you see moments of mourning and of sadness throughout Joseph's life, but in the, 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 it all culminates when his family arrives to Egypt because they were in this great famine and his family had lost, they, they were out of food and they heard Egypt has food. And so the brothers show up to Joseph without knowing it's even Joseph asking for food. And um, there's a moment where he goes back because he can't handle that, the emotions and, and everything that he's been holding on to. And he says he goes to this other room and he just starts weeping so loudly that, that people outside the building could hear him. Right? Some of us just need to work through the grief and the loss and all the things, our, our real emotions about our past and our trauma so that we can move forward. Joseph, when he had children, he gave his children names that reflected the pain and sadness of his past in the future that God called him to. His first son was named Manasseh um, from the Hebrew word to forget. Right? Because God called him to forget his troubles, right? to be able to move on from them. And his second child named Ephraim, it's a Hebrew word for fruitful. Because God will take the things of his past to make him fruitful in the future. Now, Joseph also rewrote his life script according to God. Joseph had plenty of reasons to say to himself, I don't have a right to exist. Right? My life is a mistake. I'm worthless. I shouldn't trust people. I shouldn't take risks. That having these feelings I'm feeling is bad because it just keeps leading me to these bad places. But Joseph didn't. We often inherit negative scripts for life. Right, that we unconsciously let direct our lives. Like we talked about those self-fulfilling prophecies that we say. But staying open to God and not 
completely giving up hope that God would continue to use him, right, use Joseph, by making the most of each situation. If you know the story of Joseph, you know that when he got sold as a slave, he quickly moved up the ranks and was the top slave. I don't know if that's even a really great rank, um, but, but that's what he had. He was, he was left in charge of all of Potiphar's house. Um, and then when he got sent to prison, he got moved up to head prisoner. Again, you know, making the most of the opportunities that God had given him in life, staying faithful to him. And God gave him favor in even the hardest moments. And sometimes we don't recognize in our hardest moments that God is still giving us favor because we have titles like head prisoner, right? Um, it's not, not great in the moment of life that we're in, but what it did teach him was all the skills to later be second in charge of all of Egypt. Right? We don't understand maybe what God's doing in the moment. But when we keep living for him in the places that he's given us, that calls us to something greater, preparing us for the greater things he has ahead, right? So don't let your core sentence be your only script in life. Let God's truth rewrite your script, right? That, that you are never alone, that, that he has called you, that he has plans for you, that you have been purposefully purposed, as we say here, right? You were made with purpose and on purpose, every single one of you, right? And so no other script matters when you consider that God, the, the greatest designer in the entire world said, the world needs a you in it right now. It's been said that the real measure of our sense of self is when we are with our parents for more than three days. Right? So go, if you know your parents are still alive, go spend more than three days with them. And at that point, ask yourself, how old do you feel? Right? Have you gone back to your childhood patterns? Or have you broken free from your past to be able to live in what God has for you now? And lastly, from Joseph, we find that Joseph partnered with God to be a blessing. Joseph had all the power to do whatever he wanted when his family arrived on the scene. When his brothers showed up, they could have been like, you know what? You're going to spend 10 days in a pit. Then you're going to go to prison. And then, you know... Um, you know, and then we'll, you know, you'll be my slave for a while. We'll see how that goes. Um, and then I'll kill you and I'll just tell daddy with some wolves, you know, um, literally all of whatever he wanted to do because he was second in charge of the most powerful kingdom in the earth at the time, he could have done whatever he wanted, but what he chose to do was partner with God and bless his family and change things from generations because he fought through the trauma, brought his family in, gave them the, the best land for farming and for, for doing the things that he like, knew that they were good at. Didn't hold anything against them, but gave them a life that was blessed and changed the literally future of his family forever. Man, for those of us who've been deeply wounded like Joseph, that can feel like an impossible path. Right? Do you think of the people who hurt you and say, man, I just wish God, God would bless them with something way better. Right? I'm sure that's your thoughts. Uh, Joseph made a choice. Right? It's a choice that we have to make every day. And it's not dependent on the people or the situations around us in life. The choices are actually, are we going to believe that God is safe? Are we going to believe that God is good? Are we going to believe that God can be trusted? Because if we can believe those things, those truths, right, we can work through all of those things. I mean, the idea of going backwards to move forwards is so important. A lot of us want to say, well, if I just ignore the path, I'll keep my eyes on Jesus and I'll keep moving forward. Right? Because we see Joseph at the end of his life, but we didn't go back and work through the things. Right? If I trust that God is good, then I don't have to work through my past. I can just move forward. But what ends up happening in your life when you do that is you don't move at all. Right, you keep looking forward, and Jesus is back here saying, we got to work on some stuff. And you're like, I took down the rearview mirror. I'm not looking back there. Um, man, God uses our past, our hurts, our sadness, our trauma to get us to the future. Right? You've heard these things probably before, that, that he wants to take our mess and make it a message. He wants to take our test and make it a testimony, our trials into triumphs. He wants to make the victims the victors. Right? And as cheesy as those are, I mean, they're appropriate to what God wants to do in your life, right? Because when we ignore the past, we can't get the second half of those. If there's no mess, there is no message, right? If you don't have tests, then you don't have a testimony, 
Right? With there no, if there's no trials, there are no triumphs. That's why James 1, 2 through 4, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Man, that is not my attitude 99.9% of the time. Right? When trials come, I'm not like, a great opportunity has come my way. Thank you, Jesus. Right? No, very much that. My core sentence again props up and goes, this is the life that I've always been dealt. But actually, God keeps giving me opportunities for great joy. And I'm not choosing that opportunity. Because verse 3 continues, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Right, man, who wants to be complete and perfect, needing nothing? Just one of us. That's great. Uh, The rest of you guys, enjoy your choices. Um, No. Man, consider the traumas of your past an opportunity for great joy because I 100% believe that that's what it is. And this won't just be a one-time thing, right? The power of past defines literally every part of your life. um, And we need each part to be redefined by Christ, right? Everything is fair game. In this, right, the the way you handle money to how you navigate relationships, from gender roles to responding to authority, how you approach vacations and how you grieve death, everything is learned from our past and we need Christ to come in and redefine it. I've said it before that growing as a Christian is much like parfaits, onions, and ogres, right? It's done in layers, right? (laughs) Each season of life brings a new layer of things to work through. Right? As one layer is resolved, a deeper layer is then revealed for more work. And some, some layers are sweet, some are okay in certain situations, and others are just ugly, but they all have a purpose. Man, I, I was trying to figure out what, what is the practical application for today. Um, and uh, this is some really deep work, so I hope you guys have nothing planned for this week. Um, we're not letting you out till we all work through this stuff. No, um, Like I said, the, the book, it didn't start with you. If you haven't already ordered it on Amazon throughout this message, just get on there and order it and read it. Audible, whatever you do to read things. I, I believe that it's just such a powerful way to, to start digging into this thing and to walking through it. Man, I, as your pastor, the thing I want most for you is to walk free. To not be held back by your past and those things that are keeping you from how Christ wants you to live. Man, we get so good at applying God to just enough pieces that we can kind of stumble through life. But imagine what life would look like if you were free from all of that. Man, and so get into it. Start somewhere, right? Start at a minimum of of mapping out your family and consider what is happening that may be affecting you today. Your core sentence, all of those things. And for some of you, the first step might be just inviting Jesus into your life for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. You, you maybe realize now that, that your past has been holding you back from living life. And maybe you've already tried therapy and many other things to try and work through them, but it hasn't given you the freedom you're looking for because freedom is only found in God and Jesus and what he's done, that what he's died for so that you can live a new life. And all, if that's you and you want to make that decision, You just need to tell Jesus that you want him to be your Lord and Savior. A Savior is someone who's going to redeem your past. He's already done the work of redeeming your past. You just need to accept that, that he has done that for you. And then secondly, as Lord, that you're going to choose to let him be the one to lead you. That you're going to be okay with his plans that are better and uh, higher than yours, even though they don't always feel that way. You're going to say, I want you to be my Lord and to lead me in that life. And if that's you... Man, just close your eyes and ask him to do that right now in your own words. For everybody else, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to listen to this excerpt from Inner Compass by Margaret Self. It says, imagine yourself standing on the banks of a wide, fast, flowing river. You must cross, but there is no bridge. Jesus comes carrying a large stone and places it in the river in front of you. 
He then invites you to step out onto it. Every day he brings you another stone and then another and another. And you move further out into the water each day. One day, however, you find yourself in the middle of the river with all the water rushing around you. But no new stone has appeared. When you cannot move forward, you feel a wave of panic. You look backwards to the shore, and only then do you realize where the stones are coming from. Jesus has been systematically dismantling the cottage on the shore behind you, that place in the past where you've lived your entire life, and he's turning it one stone at a time into stepping stones for your future. You take a deep breath, and you wait for God. And when your heart is still, he quietly places the next stone in front of you. He invites you to take yet another step across the fast-moving river. You realize now he will always bring one more stone, just one at a time, and nudge you forward. You realize you can trust him as he continues to take the stones from your past and use them to lead you into a good future. God is inviting you to leave the past behind for a great future. But this is a slow process. As we step out in faith to follow him to new places, we discover that he takes the broken parts of our history to create something beautiful that we can offer to the world just as he did with Joseph. Let's pray. God, I'm learning to be grateful for my past, for the past of my family, the history of, of the generations that have lived before me, God, that helped shape me to who I am today, God, but I'm even more grateful that you're redeeming those things to help make me into a person that reflects you better into this world. God, I love the, the picture of a church full of people who have redeemed their past and the difference that we would make in the world around us if we lived from a place of healing and a place of freedom instead of a place of bondage and of hurts. God, I know that you've called us all to more. God, that these core sentences, these, these things that we let um, be negative scripts defining our life, God, is not what you've called us to. That you've called us to something more that you've purposefully purposed each one of us here. God, and I pray that, that we'd be able to work through the past, through the, those things that have been defining us, that we'd be able to you know, rewrite our, our Ten Commandments of our life to be able to move forward by the things that you declare, the truths that you speak. God, help us to do the hard work of discipleship and move forward. And help us to get a great future out of our past. God, and be with those who maybe made the first decision or, or a new decision in a long time to be a follower of you. God, as they learn to understand what it means to have you as a savior, as they learn to understand what it means for them um, to have you as Lord of their life, God, as, you, as they make this first step, God, that you would reveal yourself to them. God, pour out your love upon them in mighty ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you made that decision for Christ today, um, on that Connect card in front of you, there's a spot that says you made a decision for Christ. Um, would you fill that out and turn that in at the Resource Center? We actually have a book we want you to have um, to help you understand what that means to be a Christian and to be a Christ follower. So please make sure you do that um, for everybody else, for all of us. Go backwards so that you can move forward today.